This morning, I'm going to start a sermon series on uh, why the church matters. And you, you've, you've sensed that this was coming, I think, over the last 10, 15 years. Lots of people in America, this is already the way it is in Europe for the most part. A lot of people in America say that the church is irrelevant, the church doesn't uh, matter, the church is um, at fault about a lot of things, which it is. Uh, but let me tell you something. I've given 42 years of my life to the church. I intend to give the rest of my years to the church. And I think the church matters more than ever before. There are people who say, I maybe believe in God. I know I'm spiritual, but I don't believe in the church. I'm going to give you four reasons to believe in the church, starting today uh, with why the church matters to our children. Next week, we're going to talk about why it matters to our city. And that's more important than you might think. We're losing the great institutions that hold the fabric of society together. Uh, the next week we'll talk about why the church matters to our neighbors. And I'm going to tell you a very powerful story about this church on that day. And then finally we'll talk about why the church matters to you and me. So this morning I'm going to read from Genesis, the 15th chapter. I have perhaps read this text more than any other scripture in the Bible other than the Easter and Christmas texts. This is a scripture that guided us when we made the courageous decision to relocate because we said we're doing this for our children and our children's children. This is a story about Abraham and Sarah, their desire to have descendants. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And God said, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. It's important to know that Abram and Sarah at this point are already very old, way beyond childbearing age. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to Abram, saying, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. And he brought Abraham outside and said to him, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For 30 years I've been telling you about the wonderful Davis Mountains in West Texas, and some of you have taken me up on the challenge to drive the eight and a half hours it gets, takes to get there and go up to 8,000 feet where McDonald's Observatory, up. you didn't know we had mountains that high in Texas, did you? But we do. Where McDonald's Observatory is. McDonald's Observatory was built by the University of Texas in that spot because these are the, are the clearest skies in, the, uh, in North America. And when you go up there if, there, if it's not a cloudy night, you will look up there and you will see billions of stars, more than you could possibly imagine. That's the sky that Abraham and Sarah looked at on that particular night. What they wanted more than anything else, more than anything else, was to have children and grandchildren, to have descendants. And this was the bargain that God made with them. If you will follow me, if you will be faithful to me, Paul says this is the original act of faith in the Judeo Christian tradition. If you'll be faithful to me, I will see to it that you will have children and grandchildren and descendants that will outnumber the stars. It is a remarkable and colorful and wonderful, rich story. And it tells us that the original faith journey was to a great extent about the commitment to children. I want to make that case this morning. That much of what we do as Christians revolves around our commitment to children to teach them about Jesus, about the love of God, and about the fact that they are the children of God. Now I'll start off by sharing with you the story of a journey that a friend of mine makes every Sunday morning. She lives on a ranch out south of Marfa between Martha and Presidio. She's a part of the large Mitchell ranching family. She lives on a ranch uh, that's on the Mitchell Flats. If you've ever been to Marfa and seen the Marfa Lights, that's where the Marfa Lights are, on the, on the Mitchell Flats, between uh, Presidio, the Rio Grande River, uh, and Marfa. She lives in a house that is 25 miles off of the pavement. 
And by that, I mean she turns off the pavement onto a dirt road. It's not a gravel road. It's not an all-weather road. It is a dirt road. And she travels 25 miles to get to her home. For this reason, she homeschools her children. But every Sunday morning, she gets up early. She gets her children bathed and fed and dressed. And she loads them into her truck. And then she drives the 45 minutes it takes to get from her ranch house to the pavement. And then another 45 minutes it takes to get from the edge of the pavement to the First United Methodist Church in Fort Davis, Texas. She drives one and a half hours. When she gets there, she puts her children into Sunday school and then she helps teach children's Sunday school. And then they go to church together. And then she loads them back up into the truck and they drive the hour and a half that it takes to get back home. One day I asked her, Michelle, why do you do it? And she never even hesitated. She said, because it is the right thing for my children. That was the right answer, wasn't it? Because it's the right thing for my children. And when you put that in the context of those of us who live 5 or 10 or 15 minutes from the church, it'll make you think, won't it? A number of years ago, uh, we used to have dessert parties for the new members of our church. We got so big we don't do this anymore because we would have them in our home. Bobby and I would have them in our living room. And I remember once about probably at least 15 or 20 years ago, we had about 25 or 30 people sitting in our living room. They were uh, in a semicircle this way on chairs and on uh, the couch and so forth. And we always had the same routine. We would serve coffee and dessert and kind of you know, visit with one another. And then we would go around and we would ask each person there to introduce themselves, tell us their names, what they did, a little bit about themselves. And if they didn't tell us why they joined the church, I would generally ask them, well, tell me why you joined our church. On this particular evening, we'd gotten about halfway around. And people had given various reasons for why they joined the church. Somebody had said, you know, um, we live close by and we decided to visit. We just really enjoyed it. Somebody else said, well, our, our relatives go to church there, invited it. We loved it. Various answers like that. The answer that we got back then, and we still get more often than any other answer, is, well, we came and visited, we sat down, and it just felt like home. A lot of you have said that. Came and worshipped, and it just feels like home. But at any rate, we'd gone around about halfway, and we came to this woman. I can still see where she was sitting in my living room, right in the center of the couch, right in front of me. She's by herself. She introduced herself, told a little bit about her job and so forth. And then I said, um, tell us why you joined the church. And she was silent for a moment, and then she said this. My five-year-old daughter came to me one day, and she said this, Mommy, how will I ever learn about God if you don't take me to church? You could have heard a pin drop on the carpet of my living room, just like you could in this room now. Mommy, how will I ever learn about God if you don't take me to church? Look, this is not one of those complicated sermons. You're not going to go to lunch today and be sitting around and, and scratching your head and saying, now what was the point the preacher was trying to make today? <laughs> because that's it. How will your children ever learn about God? How will your children ever learn that they are in fact the children of God, created and loved by God before they were known by their parents, if they don't come to church? I'm going to do something a little bit unusual today. I'm going to interrupt this sermon and show you nine PowerPoint slides. The reason for this is that back in January, I sat down with our senior staff, and as I always do, I introduced three goals to them. One of them was more than a goal. It's what I call a strategic initiative. And that strategic initiative was to revitalize and re-energize children's ministries here at Christ Church. 
For 40 years, we have a history and a record of great, wonderful children's ministries, wonderful staffs, wonderful volunteers. But I thought it was, just, it was time to uh, redo all of that. And so that's what we've been doing. I have, take no credit for this. Um, the children's staff did this. But I sat down with the children's staff and I said, I want you to go wherever it takes in the United States. I want you to find state-of-the-art children's ministries. I want you to look at curriculum. I want you to look at everything. And I want you to bring it back at Christ Church and create something new. One of them said to me, well, what if, what if it means money? I said to them, whatever it takes. So we're going to go through these real quickly. If you were at rally day last night, you've already seen these nine PowerPoint slides and heard the explanations. And so you have my permission to go to sleep. <laughs> Just don't snore. We're rebranding children's ministry. It will now be called The Way. If you look at this logo, you'll see that it is both a cross and an intersection. You see the little highway uh, lines there? And you may not be able to read that. It's the intersection of faith and family. That's what we're all about at Christ Church. And the scripture that goes along with this is Proverbs 22.6. How many of you know Proverbs 22.6? Let's go to the next slide. Train children in the way they should go. And when they grow old, they will not depart from God. Next slide. This is a road map. We have brand new curriculum. This is, a, this is such a cool thing. And there will be milestones at every age in terms of what your child or grandchild will learn. Now, I know you can't read this map. I can't read it either. But it is a map that begins with when you put your child into children's ministry, and then it goes on and on until they graduate and go into the sixth grade. And the map shows the milestones, the things that they will be learning, specific concrete things they will be learning at each age and stage. Now, since you can't read the map, we're going to show you some examples of them. Go to the next slide. This, if you have a three-year-old, this is what your three-year-old will learn by the end of their first year in Sunday school. They will know how to recite God is love from 1 John, the fourth chapter. They will know how to sing the song, Jesus loves me. How powerful do you think that is? You know our children learn from singing. They will uh, be able to identify a Bible. I suspect some of them will be so smart they'll be able to read a little bit out of the Bible. And I love this last one. They will um, learn to recognize a picture of CUMC as their church. If you know how this happened to you, it's pretty powerful to drive by with a child or grandchild and, and, and they look and say, my church, that's my church. That's a very, very powerful thing. Especially for those of us who have, have spent a lot of time and effort and money making this ministry happen. By the time they reach, we're going to go to the other end. So each grade will have these milestones. Here's the one that they'll get by the time they finish the fifth grade. They will know how to sing the Lord's Prayer. They will be able to sing Amazing Grace. Again, they learn from singing. They will understand the importance of both of the sacraments, communion and baptism. Some of you maybe don't understand the importance of those two, so you'll have a chance to learn from them when they get to that age. They will know the story of Jesus in the temple, Luke 2, and they will uh, uh, understand how the Bible has practical application in our lives by using the scripture from John 13, 34, 35. You can look that up. Now, once we started working with the curriculum, the staff came to me and said, guess what? When we started visiting other churches, we learned that our rooms and that our space is more archaic than we thought. It was built in 1997, doesn't seem like a very long time to me, but it's 15 years old. They said, we need to update our facilities. And so we've already started this. We're borrowing the money from ourselves because I said, whatever it takes. So let's see this next slide. This is the new color scheme for the first grade. We've torn down some walls. We have put up, you may have noticed, we have put up security doors on every entrance where your children go to Sunday school. They're $25,000 a piece. We've spent, spent probably a couple hundred thousand dollars doing that outside the budget because we didn't, have any, we didn't feel like we had any choice. It was the right thing to do. So here's the new color scheme. We've already got, um, the painting is done. Still have to raise the money, order uh, the furniture and some of the other things. Let's look at the second grade, I think, is next. 
second grade. You'll see in this second grade uh, picture, the screen there, this will be down the line when we finish raising it. I'm raising the money for this. We're going to raise a lot of money for this and a few other initiatives, and I'm looking for leadership gifts. This isn't a fundraising sermon, but I just might as well tell you now. I'm looking for leadership gifts between $25,000 and $100,000. And I'm glad you didn't snicker because you know I'm dead serious. And I've already got two from the earlier this morning uh, because we think this is important. Eventually, we will put in state-of-the-art multimedia, PowerPoint computer, and screens so that your children will have the advantage of learning about God with the aid of uh, advanced technology. Third picture. Here's a third grade room. What's missing from this picture? Children and volunteers. We want to double the number of volunteers we have working with children. You may not be called to do that, but let me say to you that if you can tell a story, sing a song, color with a crayon, this may be the perfect fit for you. And I can tell you that if you work with children, one of two things will happen. One thing will happen and the other thing might happen. If you work with children, you might change a child's life forever. That might happen. But what will happen is that your life will be changed forever. So you can be thinking and praying about that. Next slide. Every month, they're getting their first wristband this morning. They will get what we call the big idea wristband. It was my request that the first one say, I am a child of God. I want you to think about this. Your child comes home from public school tomorrow evening and it has not gone well. A friend didn't play with them on the playground. They thought a teacher was mean to them, whatever. They're a little weepy. Think about what it will mean for you and for that child to be able to say, let's look at your wristband. What does it say? I'm a child of God. And to talk about that. What does that mean for you when things don't go well? I'm a child of God. So that's the program. You took those slides out. And that's a nice lead in to a story that I want to finish with. It's a story some of you have heard me tell before. In the early 2000s, this story made it to the internet, and I've read the story on the internet. It's full of distortions and um, things that aren't exactly true. And the reason I know it is because I heard the story back in the early 80s from the one to whom it happened. And I'm going to tell you the story now, and I can, I can pretty well assure you that I will tell it almost word for word the way he told it. Back in the early 1950s, Dr. Fred Craddock and his wife were vacationing in the Smoky Mountains of eastern Tennessee. They'd been driving all morning, it was about noon, and they were driving through a little hamlet up in the mountains, and on the side of the road was a little diner. Fred turned to his wife, he said, I'm hungry, what about you? She said, yeah, he said, let's stop here and get, grab a sandwich real quickly. So they pulled up, they went in, it was one of those little diners, there was a bar there, and you know, little bar stools, and there were a few tables. They deliberately went back to the table at the end of the, of the little restaurant so they could have some privacy. They got little uh, menus. They ordered some sandwiches. The waitress walked away. Dr. Craddock said that there was an old man with gray hair, dressed in overalls, sitting at the bar. And after a few minutes, he saw him turn over and look at them. He knew, of course, that they were strangers. And he got up and started walking towards them. I still remember Dr. Craddock saying, oh no, all I wanted was a sandwich. I didn't want a conversation. But the man came up to him, to them and said, howdy folks, my name is Ben Hooper. And he pulled out a chair and sat down and joined them. <laughs> Dr. Craddock introduced himself and his wife. They made some small talk. At one point, Ben Hooper said, where are you from, son? And he said, we're from Oklahoma. And he said, what do you do? Dr. Craddock said, I'm a preacher. And the man stopped and was silent for a moment. And then he said, let me tell you about a preacher that I knew in these parts many, many years ago. He said, I was born just a few hundred yards from where we were sitting. This is where I grew up. But when I was growing up, my mother did not have a husband. She had never been married. 
I didn't have any idea who my father was. He said, this was before the turn of the century. He said, Dr. Craddock, can you imagine what it was like to grow up in a time like that, in a place like this, under those conditions? He said, the school that I attended is just right down the road. It's not there anymore, but it was just right down the road from where we are today. I can remember attending school and carrying my little lunch with me and sitting out on the playground under a big oak tree and eating my lunch and then literally crying myself to sleep day after day after day because none of the children would play with me. On Saturdays, my mother would take me to town with her. And I can remember Saturday after Saturday after Saturday going with my mother and walking down Main Street and having the crowds part just like the parting of the sea because no one wanted to even get close to us. And I can also remember the women who whispered in stage whispers so that we could hear them calling my mother names, calling me names, the ugliest names you can possibly imagine. Can you imagine what it was like to grow up in a place like this back in those days? He said, one day a preacher came to town, a new preacher. He was preaching in a church that was located about two miles from here on the other side of the valley that you see right there. I heard about him. I was about 10 or 11 years old, and I decided to go to church one Sunday night. I walked the two miles to that church, and I waited till everybody was in, and I heard the music and the service had started so that no one would stop me at the door and tell me that I was not welcomed. I went into the church. I sat on the back row. When I left, I left early so that nobody would stop me and tell me to never come back again. There was something about that preacher that fascinated me. He was tall, handsome. He had long, flowing silver hair and a baritone voice. He said, I I didn't always understand what he was saying, but I was mesmerized by him. So I came back the next week. Came in late so nobody could tell me not to enter. Left early so nobody could tell me not to come back. And week after week, every Sunday night, I came back to hear that preacher. He just fascinated me. One Sunday night, I don't know exactly how it happened. I guess I got caught up on that back row singing the last hymn. I wasn't paying much attention. When I got ready to leave, somehow that preacher beat me to the front door of the church. And when I hit the foyer, I looked up, and there he was, standing in the front door, blocking my way. I tried to duck under him, but I couldn't do it. He reached down, and he grabbed me and caught me with these two huge hands. He held me by the shoulders. And he looked down at me, and he said, Son, do you know what you are? And he said, I braced myself to hear the word that I'd been called so many times in my life. And he looked down and he said, son, you are a child of God. You are a precious child of God. He said, Dr. Craddock, I went on to become twice elected the governor of the state of Tennessee. Amidst the dirtiest campaigns you can possibly imagine, There were people who erected big billboards along our state highways that said, you don't want a bastard for a governor. But it didn't make any difference to me because I knew who I was. I knew I was a child of God. If you live in Plano or Frisco, or Allen, you're lucky people. We're the luckiest people in the world, the best schools in the state of Texas, I suppose. If your child goes to the Plano Public School District, or the Allen, or Frisco, or Lovejoy, or Carrollton, or one of the private schools around here, by the time they graduate, they're going to have a pass a lot of those milestones like we talked a minute ago in public schools. They're going to know math, 
in science and English. They get to the they get to the Plano Senior High School, they'll learn algebra and calculus and physics. They're going to be as prepared as anybody can be to go to junior college or to college or to work. Some of your children will probably make it into an Ivy League school. Several of them will go to graduate school. They'll earn advanced degrees, an MBA perhaps from SMU. And they'll go on to get great jobs. They'll have the experience of growing up in a place that has probably more sports opportunities than any other place I know of in the world. Great soccer leagues. They might be a select soccer player. Gymnastics, competitive dance, baseball, football, you name it. They will be privileged in many ways. But the day will come when the high school degree won't be enough. The day will come for your child or your grandchild when the MBA or the $300,000 salary won't be enough. The day will come when the closet full of sports trophies and all of the awards won't be enough. The day will come when the only thing that will matter to them is the knowledge that they are a child of God, a beloved and precious child of God. And that is why the church matters to our children and why it always will.